Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today, we're getting enthusiastic about language and smell. But first, we're heading into our November anniversary. Yay! Three whole years of Lingthusiasm. And in celebration of that, we are, as we have done for all our anniversaries, we are trying to help more people than ever find the linguistics enthusiasm uh, that we know and love. So most people still find podcasts through word of mouth. And this year, we thought of something to help talk about it. We want to help people find Lingthusiasm by sharing with them what makes linguistics so great. So we're asking you to share a thing that you've learnt from Lingthusiasm uh, over the first three years of episodes. So if there's a, a fun fact or a story or an anecdote that you find yourself retelling or mentioning to people, um, that will be a great thing to post on social media or to tell someone about, hey, there's this podcast that's cool. Here's something I learned from it. It's also really helpful to us because, Lauren, you and I have been doing linguistics for quite a while. And we sometimes forget which things aren't new to us, but are actually new and exciting to other people. So help us remember which things are new and exciting for you to learn about. And if you can't think of one in particular, because there are so many great things that you've learned on the show, stay tuned to our social media. We'll be retweeting and sharing other people's facts um, so you can get some Lingspiration. <laughs> and so you can also reshare anybody else's facts that you would like to co-sign. Uh, and we've noticed that some of our biggest growths in listenerships have been from other people pointing out interesting things that they've learned recently. And so we thought we'd try to do that more formally for the anniversary. So share uh, something interesting you've learned something you find yourself retelling to other people, and uh, other people will realise this is where they can get more stuff like that. I love every anniversary we come back and encourage people to share their enthusiasm, uh, because every year we have been growing, we have been reaching new ears. Maybe you are new ears since our last anniversary. Maybe you have been with us since episode one. But we're always excited to encourage new people to discover that linguistics is fun and interesting and relevant to their everyday life. We also have uh, another new Patreon bonus episode. This one is about surnames. Uh, so listen to this and support the show on Patreon. And you can also share your stories about where your surname comes from and any linguistically interesting things that happen to you because of your surname. We talk about the origins of McCulloch and Gorn in that episode. We also have over 30 bonus episodes for you to listen to. That's almost half the number of shows. So if you've listened to the whole main episode back catalogue, there's almost as many episodes again waiting for you um, over at the Patreon. So there's your solution for, oh no, I've listened to all of the Enthusiasm episodes. What do I do now? The answer is go listen on Patreon. There are lots of things for you still to listen to. And thank you if you've been supporting us on Patreon already. You help us keep the show ad-free and ticking along. We also have exciting new Lingthusiasm merch for you. By popular demand, you can now get Lingthusiastic socks. I'm very excited about the socks. So all three of our prints, the International Phonetic Alphabet, the Tree Structure Diagrams, and the Esoteric Unicode Symbols, are now also available on socks, in addition to the scarves and ties and mugs that they were previously available on. We have multiple patterns, we have multiple colours, and you can buy them along with all of our existing merchandise. And we also have greeting cards that say thanks and congrats in IPA, as well as some other greetings. So if there are any linguists that you need to thank or congratulate as the year winds to a close, that is something you can now do. Plus, I get this, I'm really excited about this. <laughs> we have water bottles that have the glottal symbols from the IPA on them. So they are glottal bottles. I'm so pleased. <laughs> You can get your nice glottal bottles for your water, or it's even more satisfying if you're the kind of person who says water with a, a glottal stop in the middle of water. Or bottle with a glottal stop there too. Uh, so they have the glottal stop, the glottal fricative, and the voiced glottal fricative, uh, and people won't know that's what they are until you tell them, so I'm so pleased. And finally, we have new t-shirts and mugs that say, Linguistic Correctness is Just a Lie by Big Grammar to Sell You More Grammars. To check out the full set of Lingthusiasm merch, of which there's quite a lot at this point, go to lingthusiasm.com slash merch. It makes a great gift for the linguist or linguistics enthusiast in your life. Gretchen, 
what is your favorite smell? Oh, there are so many good smells. Uh, so I really like the smell of rose. I also really like the smell of almond. It depends on whether、mm-hmm. you're talking about like to wear or to eat. I also really like like spicy scents. Almonds, as in like fresh almonds or almond blossoms. No, like almond extract that you bake with. Okay. Yeah,、oh, like like marzipan. Well, yeah, or like like、um, amaretto, or like like vanilla extract, but almond. It's so good.、Mm-hmm. I could just I could eat eat slash smell that forever. What's your favorite smell? This one always slightly stumps people in the northern hemisphere, but I love the smell of freshly cut grass、uh, because it reminds me of Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think says a lot about how frequently my family ever got around to mowing the lawn. <laughs> I mean, I agree. The smell of freshly cut grass is really good. I didn't think of that one. There's also like the smell of the earth when it rains, but it doesn't really remind me of Christmas. <laughs> the smell of new fallen snow reminds me of Christmas. Also a great smell.、Mm, not a smell that I know or identify as readily. Oh, it's a very distinct smell, and the smell of like crisping leaves in the in the fall also、mm. also a very good smell. We have um. Not as many of them, but we have a particular kind of lemon gum tree in Australia that always smells really amazing on campus just before the academic year starts in like February March. And whenever I smell that smell, I get really excited because it means classes are going to start soon. We're going to have students back on campus, and I it reminds me of like undergrad days and starting university. And so for me, smells are often really linked. I mean, clearly, if they're two of my favorite smells, smells are really linked to like particular times and places for me. Yeah, I was just kind of looking around my house, thinking what what smells good around here. But then when you start getting in the time and place, I'm like, oh yeah, that that leaf smell in the fall is also very back to school for me.、Uh, or that you know the distinct smell of each season, like the spring smell when everything is melting. Yeah,、um, also a nice smell. But it says a lot about English that we have to be like the smell of spring or the smell of. Freshly mown grass or freshly fallen snow. We kind of just don't have the best vocabulary for talking about smells, other than referring to the thing that they relate to. Yeah, and I'm thinking of this because when you asked me like, "What's your favorite smell?" I was like, "Oh, I have a ready answer to like, what's my favorite color." But I don't have a ready answer to what's my favorite smell because it's not something that we think about in terms of like the abstract smellness of it. Like I'm not like, oh, my favorite color is the color of pomegranates or something because I can actually just name that color. It would be funny though if you like my favorite color is the red of strawberries and not the red of cherries. <laughs> yeah, exactly.、You're、like the that orangey red of like a sunset, but like not like a neon light, but like the sunset. <laughs> But we do that for smell. That's how we talk about smell. There's a long literature on the way that we talk about smell, and that smell is maybe not as complicated as the other sense. But in a lot of ways, that's a very culturally driven thing. And in fact, as we'll talk about in this episode, there are other cultures where scent is a lot more motivated in the where scent is a lot more a part of the language, and it makes it a lot easier to talk about it. So is this an English thing or a European languages thing or what's the?、It、seems to be one of those weird Europeans thing. Okay, where if we actually look at a wider diversity of the world's languages, things are a lot more interesting. And、uh, when I say we, I mean a, a group of linguists, and particularly Asifa Majid, who works on the relationship between language and smell. Yes,、yeah, so we're going to be citing Asifa Majid a lot in this episode.、Uh, go follow her on Twitter. <laughs> All of her work is really great, and.、Um, I mean, there is some broad studies around smell, so、um, we know that experts tend to be better than novices at smelling smells. How does one become a smell expert? Is this a thing I can do? If you are a perfumer, or、okay. if you work with wine. Oh.、Um, although apparently, if you work in a particular industry, like you might be very good at smelling wine, but it doesn't make your ability to smell. Flowers necessarily any better? Oh, really? So this is very like domain specific smell sm- smell expertise, smell expertise, S- smell expertise, smell expertise.、Yeah. Yep. I would sign up for this job. Like, oh, I get to drink a lot of wine and smell it. I get to eat a lot of chocolate and smell it. I think it's one of those jobs that's like great in theory, and then when you're <laughs> you've smelled five hundred chocolates, that's true. It's probably like video game tester where you're like, actually, this is not as fun as what I signed up for. <laughs>、um, but I think being a linguist is as fun as I signed up for. So maybe there's some people who are super enthusiastic about smelling chocolate. <laughs> I'll stay being a linguist and just eat chocolate in my spare time. 
Uh, so experts are better than novices, and pollution can affect the way we perceive smells. Yeah, so maybe part of why you're not as sensitive to smell is if you're in a, a an olfactorily noisy environment. However, there was a study that looked at perfumers who work in perfume shops. You know how you walk into a like perfume store or cosmetic store and it's like... This wall of perfume smell. Yeah, that doesn't seem to affect people in that workplace. They can kind of deal with that. Oh, so they just kind of like, it becomes the kind of white noise of smell in their background and then they can distinguish between perfume smells still. Yeah, which makes you realise just how clever human brains are. That's good. Yeah. Because like, if I make cookies or something, like at first my apartment just smells like cookies, but then afterwards, sometimes if I leave and come back, I'm like, oh, it still smells like cookies here. But if I stay in there, I stop noticing it. And then, of course, there are another group of people who are relatively good compared to the population at discerning smells, and they are people who have odor color synesthesia. Ooh, I have other synesthesias, but not odor color. Yeah, we've talked about synesthesia a bit in other episodes, and at its most basic, it's where your your brain takes in one sensory bit of information, but also processes it as though it's another bit of sensory information. And so there are people who, when they smell things, register it as a particular color. Right. I guess that kind of makes sense to me because I have grapheme color synesthesia. So when I see particular letters or numbers, I also see colors associated with them. So I can see how one could have smells associated with colors. But I think for me, it would just be like, I'm picturing the thing that it smells like. And that's probably not actually what the synesthesia has evolved. And so they studied people who have this synesthesia compared to regular old sniffers like me and found that they were more consistent and accurate at naming odors. Interesting. Okay, cool. So let's talk about some of these languages that actually do have more odor terms than English does. Yeah, so obviously synesthesia is something that affects people randomly in the population, but then there are these cultures in which there are far more words and terms for talking about smell, and that seems to have implications as well for how smell is used in these languages. Right. So one of these languages is Tepehua. And specifically, there's a paper about Huehuatla Tepehua, which I hope I'm pronouncing right, but I'm not completely sure. And this is a language spoken in the state of Hidalgo in the eastern Sierra Madre in the central Gulf Coast region of Mexico, um, named after the town where it's spoken. And it's related to some other languages that are spoken around there. And this is a really interesting paper uh, with Asifa Majid and some people who work on this language in particular. And they did an elicitation study on particular scents. And they found 23 specific groups of scent words in this language. And they cataloged them according to like what types of things they correspond to. And they're often smells you can kind of recognize, but that in English, we don't have specific names for those specific smells. Awesome. Can we hear some of these smell groups? Yeah, it's a really interesting list because some of them are really delightful and some of them are really bad and there's really not much in between. <laughs> so group number one, which is uli or kuli um, or skulik, there are all various different versions of that sound, um, which is a delicious smell like flowers or perfume or floral, citrus. So it, it isn't just specifically like a floral scent. It has this sort of like positive connotation and this sort of um, rich, beautiful odor. Mm. But in contrast, there's another smell group, which is number six, which is a different kind of delicious odor. And this is can or cani or canini. And this is the a delicious or beautiful odor, which might smell like clove or might be kind of fruity or might be describing the delicious odor of a free range chicken that eats corn instead of chicken feed. Right. So I think this one may be a little bit more food like. A bit more savory. Yeah. They're both really good. And there's another one, kus which is also a beautiful odor, but a slightly different beautiful odor. Again, English just doesn't really have the vocabulary for this. And in contrast, there's this group 10, which is laki or ske, uh, or shke, which is a delicious savory odor, like when shrimp or mushrooms are boiling, the smell of coffee or recently wet earth, incense, food, honey or sugar cooking, frying meat, beans but sometimes also used for an unpleasant smell, uh, like skunk, human farts, burning plastic, or burning garbage. <laughs> so this one is a little bit more controversial. Mm, wow, that one definitely covers a gamut. Yeah. Asifa also did some work with researchers who work on Chapala, which is a language of Ecuador in the Barbacoan family. And similarly, they found these smell terms that turned up that – um kind of have a, a meaning that we kind of know immediately 
as a kind of group and, and some similar ones. So there's one for things that are sweet smelling、um, or perfume,、uh, which is pindu. And then andu is for、um, fragrant and good food and like another positive term.、Um, but the one that really caught me is the smell shiju, which is the smell of burning hair. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was what this shke. Smell can also be burning plastic or burning hair, burning feathers, burning bones. It's one of those smells that, like, as soon as you smell it, you just know if you've ever accidentally put your hair too close to a hairdryer or near a fire. And we don't have a good word for it. And they're, they're, fr- cause we have the word, the smell of burning hair. It's not that we can't smell it and we can't describe it. It's just that we literally use the word hair and burning to、exactly. describe it. Whereas these words don't. Necessarily directly relate to those words. It's like the difference between saying the color of strawberries and red. Yeah. You can still talk about the color of strawberries, but you don't have a specific cover term that covers strawberries and tomatoes and apples and, you know, fire engines and these kinds of things. The really nifty thing about this is that they not only recorded these specific smell vocabulary items, there's about 14 so far recorded for Chapala, but they also turn up more frequently in narratives than descriptions of smells in English in similar narratives. Oh, that's really neat. I also really enjoyed how sometimes they draw connections between smells that I wouldn't have thought of as related. And then when they say that, I'm like, oh yeah, these are related. So this kind of aromatic smell or almost painful smell,、um, which is lkak or lkak in Tepehua is spicy or strong smell like peppermint, eucalyptus, lime, like calcium hydroxide, not、uh, like a lime citrus. Yeah. And one of the descriptions is it's so spicy or strong that it'll make you sneeze. Hmm.、Uh, and so it's kind of grouping together something that I wouldn't necessarily have immediately grouped together. This is something else that I really enjoyed about this Tepehua paper is that they also describe the methodology for how they went about getting this list of smells. Because of course, you know, like, can you translate these English words is not necessarily a good way of doing smells in particular because English doesn't have the word to translate necessarily. And so instead they use these tools called sniffin sticks. There's no G there. It's sniffing sticks. <laughs> the, the apostrophe there is very important. <laughs> And so, of course, we would have looked up on the website, like, what, <laughs> what are sniffing sticks? <laughs> I mean, we got really excited. We were like, should we have practiced this methodology ourselves? Like, should we get some of these and smell them? Yeah, so sniffing sticks apparently are these little kind of plastic tubes that look kind of like a marker. And you think maybe of those like scented markers that maybe you had when you were a kid? Did you have those? We had those, but this is like those, but more science. Those, but science, because they don't smell like artificial cherry. They smell like real smells and like high quality smells and not always pleasant smells because you don't just want like a whole bunch of fake fruits. You want like a bigger range. And they also smell really consistently across all of the sticks and they have the same like intensity of smell. Yeah, because I was thinking, well, you know, maybe instead of buying the sniffin sticks for like 200 euros. <laughs> <laughs> from this website.、Uh, maybe I could just make my own.、Yes. This is where the plan came to a quick end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, maybe we should get some sniffing sticks, Lauren. And then it was like 200 euros later, maybe we're not going to get sniffing sticks.、Um, but they have very specific flavors. And so instead of just like buying some essential oils and like dabbing them on the, you know, bit of cloth or something, these are all very controlled. And they're for things sometimes that don't necessarily have an essential oil associated with them. So some of the flavors include, do you like a list of flavors? Sure. Okay. Orange. Yum. Leather.、Mm. Cinnamon.、Mm. <laughs> peppermint.、Mm-hmm. Banana.、Mm. Lemon. Yeah. Licorice. Okay. Turpentine. Oh, actually, no, my mum used to do oil <laughs> painting, so I'm very weirdly nostalgic about turpentine. <laughs> okay.、Uh, garlic.、Mm. Coffee. Lovely. Apple. Great. Clove. Pineapple. Rose. Fish. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> This is like the like lunchroom smell.、Um, flower in general, like, I don't know what the difference is between that and these specific flowers, but okay. A pear, like、mm-hmm. the fruit. Yeah. Cola, I guess like Coca Cola or something.、Uh, lilac, lilac. How do people say this word? I've been corrected on this word before. I say lilac. I say lilac. It's okay.、Um, grapefruit, grass.、Uh, there's our freshly cut grass smell. Raspberry, honey, ginger. Coconut, lavender, melon, peach, mushrooms, smoked meat,、mm. 
There's your savory smells, chocolate, onion, menthol, soy sauce, sesame oil, caramel, Yum. and eucalyptus. What a what an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the, it's it's a really interesting list. They're they're fairly pleasant smells. You know, some of the smells that I was seeing in the list of smells from from different languages were things like you know the odor of sweat or fermentation or you know disgusting odor like rotting meat. And they don't seem to be forcing people in the lab to smell skunk or rotting meat, which I think is very nice of them. Very kind. <laughs> there are some more savory smells like smoked meat and leather and sesame oil and stuff like that. Obviously, the sniff and sticks have a lot of advantages in terms of the consistency and they're portable and can be shared very easily. Apparently, they last for at least a year, uh, according to the manufacturer. Hmm. So it's more efficient than just getting a slice of lemon and putting it in a jar? Well, you say that, but uh, there's another smell research paper that I read, and I have a summary of it on my blog from a few years ago. I'll link to it. But they were looking at whether people had an association between particular odors and colors, mm -hmm. um, even if they weren't people who had synesthesia. Ah. And to do this, they looked at um, English speakers and they looked at speakers of Jahai, which is a language on the Malaysian peninsula that does have a really rich smell lexicon. And to do this study, because they were looking at Things like coffee and banana and coconut that both groups might recognize, but they were also looking at smells that only each group might recognize. So they had peanut butter for the English speakers and galangal, which is a really nice aromatic that would be familiar to the Jahai speakers, but not the English speakers. Um, they put them in plastic bottles with little spray things on top, like you use for cleaning, and would just kind of ah, spray okay, yeah. the air from the bottle at people. Waft some smell. I mean, okay, I guess this works. If you don't have 200 euros to buy some sniffing sticks, you can get a lemon and put it in an empty spray bottle and spritz it. And so they did this to look at whether people associated particular colors with smells. And they did, when they recognized it, they would if it was like, um, for the smell of coffee, they would think of brown, and for the smell of banana, they would think of yellow. So again, kind of showing that our ability to think about smells is tied to the objects that we're smelling more than the smells independently, whereas it was um, – Jahai speakers were much better at identifying smells. They use smell a lot. They're hunter-gatherers. It's much more part of their daily life skill set. Have a very rich smell vocabulary. Yep. Well, so I noticed on the Sniff and Sticks website, which – Again, I can't quite get over that they actually have a smell training kit. Oh, excellent. Uh, which contains four vials mm. smelling like lemon, rose, eucalyptus, and clove. I don't know why they picked those particular ones. And I just want to read you this description because it's really good. Okay. The different sticks contain odorants from everyday life, which can enlarge your sense of smell. We'll be delivered in a box with cotton hand gloves. The idea that our sense of smell can be improved via training might at first seem strange, but the more you think about it, the more it makes sense. Going to the gym and lifting weights can improve muscle mass and tone, and practicing the guitar regularly will hopefully improve proficiency. So we'll spending time sniffing odors, estimated results starting after six to nine months of regularly sniffing these. <laughs> plastic vials. What? I mean, in that time, you could just learn to speak Jahai. <laughs> I, you know, that one's only 49 euros. I'm tempted, but I think maybe I'll pass. <laughs> if anyone has given yourself a course in smell training, please let us know how it goes. You could enroll in like a wine tasting course for a similar amount of price, I feel like. <laughs> um, Lauren, you were the one that suggested that we do an episode about smell. How did you get into smell? I mean, I've always been a fan of Asifa's work, I think is probably the very first reason that I get really excited about language and smell. And I got an opportunity to apply all the feelings that I have about scent in language when I wrote a constructed language for PM Freestone's Shadow Scent fantasy series, which has been so much fun. So there's a book that has a conlang in it and you made the conlang. Correct. Like a smell conlang. So Shadow Scent is set in a world uh, that has a lot more focus on scent. And PM Freestone is one of those people that has, I think, a, a very acute sense of smell. And so I think because smell has been so central to her life, a lot of this story is set around scent. Even when the story is not set around it, the writing is so beautifully evocative of smell in a way that a lot of English language writing isn't. 
And she came calling and said, like, hey, can you can you help me with the language aspects of this book? Yes. And I got involved early enough that I also got to make sure that all the characters and the place names were internally consistent with the language. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Once you start doing linguistics, it can sometimes be... I refer to this as the Khaleesi problem. Okay. Uh, so when George R. R. Martin wrote Game of Thrones, the word Khaleesi was... It's spelled K-H-L-E-E-S-I. But the problem is English speakers say E and I the same way. Right. And so if you actually listen to Dothraki, the language from Game of Thrones, it's pronounced Khaleesi, but no English speaker pronounces it that way. Right. And like English speakers who like give their kids the name Khaleesi, they don't call them Khaleesi. Yeah. And so you end up having to kind of like reverse engineer a whole bunch of weird system for the language if you have somebody get involved for the conlang too late. Whereas if you do it really early, then you can make sure that all the character names are internally consistent. Yeah. And David J. Peterson talks about the challenges of and, and like the complexity of working with a series that was already multiple books in. I'll uh, link link to some of that. But I had the luxury of coming in early and uh, creating the language so that it fit the place names and the people names, but also could be involved in creating uh, the full language as well. So I've read this book because it's available in the UK now, even though it isn't out in North America, you were able to send me a copy because it's coming out uh, this month, next month? In November. Because it's coming out in November. And so I read it and I was expecting because you were talking about the language like, oh, there's going to be like every other page is going to have like full paragraphs in this language. Like I'm going to have to do a lot of decoding in order to do this, which I was excited about, but also a bit nervous about. I feel like I would say I'm sorry to disappoint you, but actually the book is such a great romp <laughs> that uh, we didn't need to be held down with linguistic puzzles on every other page. I mean, I enjoyed the story a lot. I just like um, it's clearly there's got to be a lot of work that you put in behind the scenes that you don't actually get to see in the pages of the book. There's definitely like the the glacier is always a good metaphor for this kind of work where there's an incredibly large amount of kind of figuring out the mechanics of the language that happen behind the scenes. And we have a dictionary and I have the, the basics of a grammar. And then you have this tiny bit at the top that you actually see comes through in the book. Can you tell us, because I think I speak for everybody here, that, you know, your average Ling enthusiasm listener is also going to be more interested in the language aspects than the average reader might be. Can you tell us more about what's actually in this language that doesn't necessarily appear in the pages? Sure. So there's a couple of uh, translational tidbits in volume one of Shadow Scent. Um, but I was interested in creating a language that was really true to the world that it was spoken in and kind of knowing about this work with Chapala and Jahai and these languages that have much more of a focus on scent than English does, I wanted to do justice to it. And there are two schools of thought when you create a language. Mm -hmm. There's the people who try and strive for like natural languages that kind of make as much sense within what we know about what human languages do. And then there are people who make artificial languages that deliberately go against what we know human languages can do. And for a lot of what I did with the language of Adam Teskin, which is the language in the books, is a lot of it fits with what we know about human languages. It has a set of sounds that you would expect to see in a possible human language. It has a lot of grammatical features that aren't very exciting because I wanted to be a bit more playful and create a language that doesn't really exist when we look at what happens with smell in the world's languages. Oh, that's so interesting. So, you know, so the sounds are pretty, you know, vanilla, to use a scent metaphor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the the words for smell, like we talked about these other languages that have these rich inventories of words for smell, it's got a lot of these. And it also does some stuff that natural languages, as far as we know, don't do. Yes. So one thing is I just made sure that there were lots of verbs for to smell, because in English we have, you can smell, you can sniff, but there's not a really rich vocabulary. So you can olfact. Um, to olfact. <laughs> and so uh, I created a whole bunch of different verbs. There's only one verb for like to move. You don't run, you don't walk, you don't stroll, uh, you just move. Ah, uh. That's not very exciting. But I have verbs for to smell something slowly for a long time, mm. um, to smell something by kind of wafting it, to accidentally smell something and then discover that it's disgusting and it's too late. <laughs> oh, no. 
I love which this. I feel like is a, a, a feeling we've all had before. Um, to smell something that you can remember, but you can't immediately place. Ooh, like the tip of the tongue phenomenon, but like the tip of the nose phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, to smell something with great enthusiasm. <laughs> this is delightful. Uh, but I'm always expanding. So if there is any form of to smell, I can create a word for it. Hmm. Okay. I'll have to put my thinking cap on. So if you have any particular forms of smelling, um, I'm always, it's one of those areas of vocabulary that I'm just adding to all the time. What about to smell something and you're not sure if it's disgusting or not? You're like, maybe that's a good smell, maybe that's a bad smell, and you need, like, you're, you're kind of smelling it experimentally? Hmm, yeah. You know what? I'm going to add that. Because I was thinking about this from our list when we were looking through the other things from other languages, and some of the words really kind of bordered on, is this disgusting or not? And it's one of those things where, like, some people find the smell of durian or other really pungent fruit really pleasant, and other people don't. And some people have this moment of like, oh, I don't know. Uh, so that's a really great one. I'm going to add that to the language. Excellent. I feel so proud. I've had a contribution. <laughs> um, and then one of the other things that I did is we talked a lot about how all of our words for smells are like, it smells like burnt hair, or it smells like an orange. Mm -hmm. All of the, or as many of the vocabulary items as I could in the language are the smell. So the basic vocabulary item is the smell of oranges. And then you have to change that word to come up with the thing that smells like oranges. Oh, wow. Okay, so that's really interesting. So if you want to talk about actual oranges, you have to say the thing that smells like oranges. Yes, so flipping the whole thing on its head. That's great. It's like how some languages, like, their adjectives have the shapes of verbs, um, whereas in other languages their adjectives are, you know, a little bit more like nouns or something. And this is like everything is, is scent-derived as much as possible. Uh, did you, is it, do you want to talk about scent evidential? So in another, a previous episode, we talked about how languages have different strategies for introducing sources of knowledge. So you can say, I witnessed this myself. I heard it secondhand. Uh, you know, I deduced it from the available evidence. This seems like a really good place to introduce some sort of smell thing, right? Uh, you will be unsurprised to know, given that evidentiality is something I have worked on for a long time and thought about for a long time, I couldn't resist putting grammatical evidentiality into this language. For smell. But Aram Teskin has an evidential system that does not exist, as we know of, in any human language. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for not disappointing me. And so we have – a lot of human languages will have, like, I know because I sense this using any of my senses, or I know this because I saw it – and then they might have another form that is used for all the other senses. Uh, in Aram Tescan, we have, I know this because I smelt it, or I know this because I used one of my other scents, which aren't as important or interesting. Uh. Um, and this <laughs> divide is definitely not – I mean, I don't think there's any language we've come across so far that has a specific grammatical evidential just for smell, uh, let alone one that yes. has one for smell and prioritizes it over all the other scents. <laughs> This is delightful. Uh, and so even though this is not actually in the pages of the book, you can kind of feel this additional attention to sense and smell kind of permeating the manuscript, wafting from it. Yes, as well as the lovely wafting scent of printed books if you buy the paper version. <laughs> That's true. There is that smell. Maybe maybe there's a language that has a better word for that. <laughs> Maybe they could print it with those smell marker sniffing sticks, and then you could like scratch and sniff the entire book. Have you thought about suggesting this to uh, to PM Freestone? Oh, it would be so amazing. It'd be really expensive, I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> Pay two hundred euros, get this scratch and sniff version of Shadow Set. This is not available. I'm making this up. <laughs> um, but maybe this is something you can get. It would be so lovely. Uh, even if you have to DIY the smell environment, Shadow Scent, The Darkest Bloom, as it's known in the UK, is out there now. Shadow Scent, as it's known in the US, is out uh, November 5. It has a lovely hardback and a map in it in the US edition. So that's Ooh. going to be super fancy. And uh, book two will be out in 2020, I believe. Well, I'm looking forward to book two. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe I'll have to kind of DIY my own scent experience for the book. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com.
You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves, IPA ties, and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. I can be found as at Gretchen A. Mixie on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. And my book is called Because Internet, and it makes a great gift for anybody who might be interested in internet language in your life. To listen to bonus episodes and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Recent bonus topics include surnames, metaphors, and a Q&A with me about Because Internet if you want to know behind the scenes how it was to write. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life, especially this month if you want to say something interesting that you enjoy sharing from a Lingthusiasm episode, and then we can share them with other people and people can discover the podcast that way. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our audio producer is Claire Gorn, our editorial producer is Sarah Doppiarella, and our editorial manager is Emily Greff. Our theme music is Ancient Cities by The Triangles. Stay enthusiastic! enthusiastic.